there we go. Um, no, it's uh, it's kind of funny because like, so actually the whiskey behind me, I'm getting better at this. There we go. Um, that is a bottle of Woodson whiskey. It probably tastes like fire. No, it's actually really good. It's a nice whis uh, whiskey. It's uh, mm. aged in his wine barrels that he makes. Oh, nice. And when he Where's was here from? in Grand Rapids, uh, I believe it's from Calif San Diego. Yep, California. But nice. when I had him, when I met him, sorry, I'm still bad at this like thing. He signed it. Oh, dude, you can't open it then. No, I, I you mean, you can go to no. you know a local liquor store and go buy buy that um, yeah. for like 35 bucks. So, no, I'm not going to open that. And then it's like the other whiskey I have, it's like I have a blend fitted 12 year that I don't. That's not really a drinking whiskey. Um, and I just have right. shit like that in the house where I'm like, oh, here's a something that's like a little bit more money than I'm willing to just slam right now currently. I don't know. Right. It's really weird though. Like, it's kind of funny. Like I was actually thinking about this the other day, um, you know, kind of speaking to some guitars and gear and stuff like that. It's like, you have some stuff you're like, Oh, this is just too nice. Like I, this is like a nice thing. I'm only going to, you know, treat this very nicely. And then it's like, you have other things you're like, Oh, this is like, you know, it's whatever. I'm just going to, it's, it's worth beating to shit. Cause that's what it's for. Right. And it's funny how you right. assign a pseudo value based on whatever crazy thing is going on in your head. Like, I'm sure you have guitars. Where you're like, this is oh, a yeah, fucking dude. workhorse. I'm just going to beat the shit out of this. I'll take it on the road. It doesn't matter. But then you I have, have some, I'm sure, right behind you. Where you're like, this never leaves the house. Yep. Yep. I have three guitars <laughs> that never leave the house. And they I, they should. They they appear in all the video, videos. But they're like, my relics. Same with like... Uh, what is it I'm that makes them like, so special, though? What um, is it about how they play? Thing? How they play. It's I mean, it's as goofy as it sounds like... Uh, you know when you hit a pinch harmonic and it's just it's just perfect. Like there's certain things. About I still haven't figured out like how to do that. those consistently. Oh, it's I, I yeah, suck. It's I, I haven't been able to get it's, squealies and pinchies very well. Pre practice makes perfect. No, um, I know. There's just certain guitars I love how they feel, and then others where they feel okay. They they feel like live guitars. So, mm. but it's weird. I have I have stuff like any vinyl of like any record I've ever made. I've never opened it. It's like sealed it will never be opened uh, i don't even know why it's one of those things i remember you guys tripping out over the uh serpent vinyl i came and had you guys sign like at this uh dude pyramid scheme show forever ago actually the last two years ago a fan sent one to me mm. like uh they Do asked you guys have a po ad. box i got oh, one for that you were getting there yeah no they were no i didn't give my home address but i was pretty stoked <laughs> actually randomly a fan sent me a, a record i never had of ours so it's pretty dope it's kind of weird like you know i i was thinking about this because like kind of thinking about you know you guys' show is coming up you guys are you know rehearsing for a lot of uh you know i feel like there's maybe a little bit more pressure of playing a hometown show versus like just any other gig because it's like, like it's kind of the old stomping ground so maybe you feel like you got to throw in something like way older or deeper cut for like the hometown well, fans Right, the band still remains. Um, we're talking about. I don't feel any pressure whatsoever. Um, no, I mean, if ten people showed up, I'd probably feel a little sad. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily, with our hometown shows, um, we don't play them very often, so selling tickets mm -hmm. isn't very hard. Um, and it's not like we're playing playing two thousand cap rooms. We're playing, you know, five hundred, four hundred and fifty cap rooms. So we do that on purpose. Um, I don't feel any pressure at all. Usually it's like my favorite show. Um, I feel more pressure in cities where no one knows who the hell we are. Um, so it's easy to play for crowds where, you know, it's a sold out crowd where there's 450 of your buds from the past 20 years, all screaming along to the, the songs and everything. So personally, for me, so it's I easier. guess. Maybe this is a, a really weird, long, like jumping off point, but it, it's something I just kind of literally thought of as you were kind of saying that. Did it? Because like kind of thinking about you and I talking like you and I have talked and been friendly and friends for a very long time. Dude, but it's funny. Like, I was like talking, talking with TJ earlier today. And I was like, I don't know that I've like, aside from being at a show, like literally sitting down with the intention to have a conversation. 
I don't know if I've ever done that with Jordan. So like, I'm really interested to find out more about who he is because it's not like we grew up together technically in that sense. Like I knew of you after I moved here and you guys were already touring full time. So this is really kind of the right. first time I'll get to ask questions and kind of get to know more about you. But it's like, you know, I know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure like you and TJ had started a band before Stilly back in your high yep. school days, right? Yep, so, Shades of Amber. Okay, so kind of going back to kind of that era, because you were just kind of saying like, you know, you still get a little bit nervous. And I, and I feel like you're more of the quiet reserved one out of everyone out in the band that I've have met and gotten to know over the years that I feel like you're kind of that person who I feel like you're a quality over quantity type of a friend, like right. quality. Absolutely. Like you don't have yeah. a whole lot of friends, but you have a really good core group of people in your, your friend group. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I honestly don't have a lot of friends. I'm kind of a, a homebody. <laughs> like the guys even laugh at me. Like my wife, we've been married since 2008. So 15 years um going on 16 um i spent a lot of time with her man like even the guys mock me and joke about how i never get out just because i don't know i hang out at home i write music and watch movies i'm not one to like go to the bar on the weekends or like if i hardly go to shows anymore i'm not sure if it's from touring or what but i got so burnt out on shows for so long um so usually i only go out when friends are in town and I definitely am, uh, even on like social media and stuff, like I have to like force myself to go on and like, I don't want attention. I don't need attention. I don't, I don't care for likes and comments and all that type of stuff. It's, I do it cause I have to, <laughs> you know, it's like, like the, this type of thing's fun. Right. But as far as like bringing praise to myself, like I don't need any praise. I'm, I'm nothing special. Like I always said that to all of our fans over the years too. Like, People will come up to us and tell us stories about like how our songs have gotten them through tough times or how much they mean to them. And I, I understand that because I have certain bands like that too, but I always try to tell everyone like I'm just a nerd writing music in my basement in my pajamas. You know, like I'm just like everybody else. It's just for some reason being in a band, you get put up on like a pedestal and people think it's cool. And it's, I, I, I don't know. It's, I'm just a normal guy. Was was the success of Still Remains kind of even so quickly? And again, this is from an outsider's perspective. So again, correct me if I'm wrong with any of this, but was it hard to for you to kind of deal with some of the successes that the band was getting so so quickly? Like being someone that wasn't into necessarily doing it for accolades or any attention like that, but that's sort of what the industry you chose to be in. That's how you gain success or that's what your merits are based on is your successes. Um, not really because, um, what people don't see about touring and being a new band, like a, a globally new band is you don't play to sold out crowds every night. It's like mm -hmm. probably was more humbling than anything because we went from being a band that would sell out, um, shows in the Midwest to, I'll never forget. We flew. We had a sold out tour. We opening for Moose and Jay's old band um, in UK and Europe. Uh, we did. I'm not sure how many dates, 20 dates on that tour. We flew to the West Coast from Europe, the West Coast of the States. I'm sorry. And then we played a show in Bakersfield, California. We played for 11 people uh in a old like strip mall center <laughs> and then two days later we flew to to two days later we flew to tokyo and played for twenty two thousand. so like there are so many ups and downs like it's kind of a mind fuck like being in a band like you go from having such a great tour and making so much money or at least in my experience to a tour of like six weeks of oh we're going to play for 25, 30 people a night. So no, no, I, I didn't have any, and we got a lot of, of, of flash. Whenever we went to the UK, we felt like rock stars, but I'm glad we didn't get that all the time because we'd come home and trust me touring the States. We felt grounded as could be <laughs> like, it was weird. Like we'd headline tours in the UK 
that bands in the states would open up for us, then we would come to the states and we'd open their tours. Right. So. Yeah, that was always the interesting thing about like this duality of careers that you had from again from an afar perspective, where it's like, what what doesn't catch? Like, why is why is the music? It's the same music, but why does one set of fan base and one demographic really take to it, and another doesn't? And I've never, excuse me, I've never really been able to figure out why that is. Because to me, you know, the concept has always been said: music is a, a universal language. So it would right. seem like it would translate to everybody equally. Dude, I, I have zero clue. I uh, <laughs> kill the lights. My my other band, Kill the Lights. Well, we released a new single uh, seven or eight days Last ago. Week? I can't remember. Last week, yep. and it's the song that I was like, it's. I jokingly say it sounds like stripper rock. Like it's just, it's a. I don't know. It's a. It's a. That's a great song. Don't get me wrong, but it's stripper metal. <laughs> And uh, it's outperforming hey. every. It's outperforming everything, and I have no no idea what the rhyme or reason is. Um, but certain things catch on, and certain things don't. And I don't under, like. I never understood. Like on the West Coast, mom still remains. We'd sell out shows left and right, but then we'd hit the East Coast, and we'd play for 15, 50 people one night, seventy five people the next night. 600 people the next night. It was just so hit and miss. I have no idea why. Hmm. Yeah, it's always it's always interesting to see that. Like I was getting into a, a little bit of a conversation the other day about an upcoming tour uh, with some friends that's coming through. And I was under the assumption my friend's band was at least going to be the headliner. Maybe it was going to be a co-headline with this other band. And when I was talking to someone that works at a venue here in town, he's like, oh, I saw that on the calendar as an early announcement. Uh, it's so-and-so show. And I was like, really? Like it's not, it's not a co-headline or like, or maybe even an off date. And this, the other, my friend's band's like not on this. And he was like, no, I think it's their show. And I was like, is that band really that big now that they can headline over this other band? He goes, yeah, man, like they're, they're crushing. And I was like, I mean, I don't know. I just saw that band like play in Detroit and basically sell out like the Fillmore. I saw them wow. like in Utah. I saw them in other States and they sold out those venues. I've seen the band that is quote unquote headlining and like, you know, at the intersection, like the last time they played, they kind of struggled to even like it sold out eventually, but it was like a day in walk up kind of a deal. And I was like, it that wasn't the case for this other band. So it, it's kind of weird to me that if they are the headliner. I just I don't see it from a numbers perspective, like consistently. And it gets weird when you start having these conversations where you're like, I see the stock of this band rising, but th this is the clear de facto headliner based on these metrics that you know matter in on that side of the, the touring industry. So it's always kind of weird when you start getting these things where it's like, it's hard not to, it's hard not to sound shitty. Like where it's like, you're, you're, you're basically giving someone's value or worth based on not the what musical quality, but just what you yeah. draw. And it's like, yeah. that kind of sucks because it's like, it it's kind of diminishes. I feel like the, what the actual thing is there, like the music and what does it do and all right. that. And it's so weird how you can marginalize it like that. That's the music industry though. Your values based on what you pull <laughs> numbers wise, no matter how good the music is and what rhyme or reason you're going to have to text me off camera. What band you're referring to, by the way. Yeah. Um, so actually, I guess, you know, that's, a, it's kind of a good way to sort of talk about two things that I've always, I wanted to talk to you about when we've been talking about doing this and skill the lights was a thing. First of all, yeah, that, yeah this alone. is like this. Yeah. Well, this interview is like what three or four years deep, like, we talked about it like every yeah. two months. It's like, yo, dude, we should get on camera. And finally, it's like, okay, we'll make it work. Yeah. Anthem Alone. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about Anthem Alone because I, when I had Spencer, or, uh, Spencer on the show a while ago, actually twice now, I have forgotten to bring that up because it's sort of a, a local oh, dude, you have to. to. Yeah. You have to. And so next yeah, time, next time I see him or next time I talk to him, I'll bring that up. But it's like, I remember because this is back in the day before Spencer had technically joined Periphery and Periphery wasn't really Periphery yet. They were still doing Bulb, essentially. And okay. I remember sitting with Hafer and everyone because you and Bone had started Anthem Alone looking for a singer. And I remember Hafer was like, dude, they just got this new dude. He's fucking incredible. Yes. And then I think yeah. uh, somebody, so I don't remember who, somebody had the demos and were playing the stuff that you had with Spencer doing like rough vocal tracks. And it so seemed like... Good. Yep. Ori originally, um, 
Casey Sable was the original vocalist of Periphery. That's right. Uh, That's right. Be, be it my ignorance, at the time, I didn't know who they were. It was 2008, so I don't think they had quite, like, yeah. br- broke as much as they have broke now, obviously. Um, I found Casey on, like, SoundCloud or something like that. Because I was searching uh, Bone, who played drums, just for the audience, on uh, Still Remain's second record, The Serpent. Um, he also played in a band called Ana Vea, local band from Great band. Lansing. Um, small, all right, let's break it out even more. The singer of Ana Vea is now in the band called Group Love, who's like That's playing Gooch? Madison's. Uh, no, Dan Gleason. Oh, okay. Gle- Yo, Gleason, shout out, bro. Um, but he's like, <laughs> yeah, last time we played Brooklyn, I texted him. He's like, oh, shoot, I'm in Brooklyn too. Like, what venue are you guys playing? I texted him. He's like, oh, I'm at Madison Square Garden. But anyways, back to back, back to Anthem alone. Um, so Casey Sable said, "Well, I quit uh, touring and I don't want to be in metal bands anymore. I have this this guy that I know named Spencer. So he sent me Spencer's contact, and Casey and Spencer uh, did a demo. Actually, the demo that Spencer sang on was a song called Unmoved, which I ended up. Um, Kibble Lights ended up taking that song, hmm. and we re- rewrote some parts." Um, but so Spencer did like a few tracks with us. And the same day I called him to say like, dude, you're, you're in the band. Let's hit the studio and start recording. He said, Oh, actually I just got the call from this band called periphery. And, uh, I think, you know, they're like one of my favorite bands I'm going to take the gig. And it was like the, the wind was completely knocked out of our sails because bone and I had spent like 12 months writing music and looking for vocalists. We finally found him, finally nailed this guy down. And, um, he, I wouldn't say he turned the, the gig down, but I think honestly, for his sake, he had joining periphery, I think worked out for him. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I haven't talked to him in probably eight or nine years. So, Spencer, if you see this, uh, I still have the same number, text me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tag but, him in this one. Uh, this post goes out. Yeah, no, it's cool. Yeah, I ended up using um, a bunch of the Anthem Alone songs for Kill the Lights, actually. Um, well, that was going to be my was next just, question was good. Um, we had so many songs written like bone and I had like 20 or 30 songs. It's I say 20 or 30 because some of them were like half written songs. Um, and when Moose originally texted me asking if uh, I wanted to start a band, I just started sending them song after song after song. And I mean, certain ones clicked with them and certain ones didn't. And, the way I looked at it and the way Bone looked at it, looked at it too was uh, it almost seemed like a shame for the songs to go unreleased. A couple of them like were soft released, like we just put them online. Um, so even like uh, one of Kill the Light's more recent releases, Scapegoat, that was originally written by Anthem Malone 16 years ago. Mm. So a song that just came out, and it's funny looking at the comments for the song. Everyone's like, oh my God, it's like a throwback to the mid 2000s of metal I'm like yeah because it was written in 2008 <laughs> but but yeah that's cool actually i see a lot of anthem alone comments on the kill the light stuff and I'm, i get stoked by it like do you really i, I do I, it's i had a lot of passion and a lot of heart in anthem alone and at the time bone and i the plan was i mean when still remains originally broke up the plan was for Bone and I to write music and get on the road. But our ultimate demise was a search for a vocalist. And I don't know if that was us being too picky because maybe we had already been through the ringer with touring and not making any money and trying to make a career out of music. So anything that came in, we were denying, denying until again until spencer came in and we're like dude let's let's do this and he said uh ah, i can't <laughs> so but yeah i'm i, I get excited it's cool I, I mean i still have a ton of anthem loan songs that no one's ever heard um and who knows maybe they'll be on the next still remains record maybe anthem alone will end up doing something or maybe kill the lights will use more of it well there's something interesting kind of in that to me where and this is going to go very local for here for a minute so when you guys had yeah. broken up initially, it was really interesting to see 
how all of you diverted because you know like uh church ended up you know starting julius uh up with you know a handful of guys around here that had just broken up from their old band tj really wasn't doing much but he kind of was doing a few things sort of you guys uh hopped in with anthem alone so it kind of was interesting and as a music fan i always like kind of seeing when people branch off and do something it's like okay what do you bring to the table when it doesn't have to be this this whole thing this whole thing that becomes still remains and still remains is sounds like this and it is this because it's a collection of the people who write it so when you and bone go off okay now what is that going to sound like church with what he was doing with you know julius and stuff like that what does that sound like where where am i pulling and i right. can even go back to church's stuff in Eretha franklin and, and a lot of the other bands he was in here locally where it's like i can kind of start doing that and going okay it's fun and interesting to see someone else's creative process and, and just who they are sonically in that capacity. And then when you go back and listen to the, the main thing everyone's from kind of going, Oh, now I can pick apart. Like, this is probably a Jordan thing. This is probably a TJ idea. This is probably a bone idea. This is, you know, whatever. And to me, that's interesting because right. it's, it's kind of your Julius your sonic. Good. Julius had some incredible songs. They're one of those bands I, that like, I think if they were all 10 years younger, they would have actually gone on to do something. I mean, mm -hmm. they really didn't break out from just kind of being a local band. I, I'm not sure why, if it's because of careers or I don't think, I don't even think they had kids back then, but no, Austin no. and Co and Mike, AJ, Luke, uh, Luke. Yes. Oh my God. Luke. Actually, Luke, he taught me a lot about, I invited Luke over to my house after um, we did a month after our touring cycle for of Love and Lunacy because I was like, dude, I'm in a metal band. I need to learn how to write solos. <laughs> He's like, all right, let's go over some scales. And actually, some of the scales that we went over uh, ended up in on the song "Anemia in Your Sheets." Um, okay. The last solo before the end of the song, but anyways, shout out to Luke. Man, it's fun bringing up all these old names. Like people I love so much, but I haven't seen in years. Well, I mean, that was a nice thing about Bridget and I going to Buffalo and getting to hang with Jay Wu for a little while. Yeah, nice. I know he's I uh, him yeah, in a while. He's he's texted me so many times and said, dude, come hang, come crash on my couch. And I really need to. It's just one of those things, the older you get, where does time go and where you where do you spend your time? Especially these days, like I reserve so much time for kill the lights. Uh, I, I I own a business. I, I have so I spend fifty hours a week working on that. Um, obviously, I'm married, and I have time that I need to reserve for my wife and for vacations and all that stuff. So I don't know these like they they say the older you get, like where does the time go? And it's like I finally understand that. <laughs> I it's funny as we dropped off Frankie today and for the listeners, here's a fun fact between uh, yes. another tie to Jordan and I. So everyone knows I've talked about it on the show. Um, I had to put my dog down alley on January 1st, 2020 New Year's Day. And I it fucking crushed my whole world. And my wife was realizing that like I need dogs, you know, in my life uh, almost daily in some capacity. Like I'm a dog lover there is a joke that at a time one time uh bridget was we were driving somewhere and she goes i started being like you're just so blatant about checking out women like it's just it's kind of fucking awful and then, and then she was like looking one day because i had a <laughs> smile on my face and she goes i realized you weren't looking at the women everybody i thought you were looking at had a dog and you were looking at the dog and that made you happy <laughs> dude that's and i was like oh yeah me. i couldn't even yeah. couldn't even tell you what the person looked like i was just looking at the dog um so all that to say that we ended up and then COVID happened and so we ended up getting a dog because Bridget was working from home a lot more. And just that made the house even more emptier when you're in it more often without, you know, companionship. So we ended up going and rescuing uh, Asha, as she was known, but Frankie, as we named her. And I happened to look at a board and it had all the dog names that had just came in and stuff like that and dogs that were up for adoption. And I started noticing themes of all the names. And so at one point I was like, oh, what's this? And then they're like, oh, OK, so like your dog was part of this breed that or this group that came from Texas. Um, yep. Actually, her brother just got adopted like a few weeks ago or a month ago or so and pulled up a photo and it's you and your wife and, and Reggie. Dude, and so I just remember going, 
I just remember going like, oh shit, I know that guy. And then I texted you, which, you know, you're kind of bad at texting and didn't get to me right away. But I was just like, hey, real quick, we're thinking about adopting this dog. Is her brother a dick? Like, is it a shit dog? Should we not get this dog? <laughs> <laughs> I saw I had and gotten they, back to you pretty fast. Yeah, I think you got back to no. me like as we were pretty much decided that we were going to get her. But it was the thing where well, it was just funny in, to be like, oh my God, I fucking know that guy. Yeah. When you're in a shelter, like you can't say no. It was actually my story. The same. I mean, we did. We turned down one. (laughs) Did you? Yeah. Fair play. Yeah, the dog that we're the other dog. (laughs) My uh, we my pup passed away in October 2019. So it was the same thing. It was like we don't have kids, um, so the house just felt so empty. But it's hilarious. How did we end up with uh, brother and sister dogs? We we still need a doggy date. It'll be an excuse for us to get together and get together and drink, really. More than anything. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so funny because we compare and it, it's funny because like even today, uh, knowing that we were going to do this, like I was telling Bridget, I was like, all right, we dropped off the kid at the in-law so we can go on our like weekend getaway. And then I was like, oh, Jordan's probably about to do the same thing with Reggie because like you're going on your vacation in a couple of days for like yeah. 10 days. So like I, I'm sure you're pretty much getting ready to pack up Reggie and take him wherever he's going for that time. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. At least just, yeah. my wife's sister is going to watch him, but. You buddy. That's so nice to not have to get up in the morning and walk the dog in the cold or do any of that stuff. You're just like, oh, it's, it's a vacation <laughs> from that. <laughs> Dude, he's he's fine. Dude, he has we got like an he's got an, a massive backyard and he chases all the squirrels and shit. So luckily I don't have to walk him anymore, but hmm. doggy date soon for sure. Absolutely. It has to happen. I just I'm so curious to know, like, will they know each other? Will they remember each other in some capacity? What's what's funny is Reggie's kind of uh, he's kind of an asshole when he meets new dogs, but like <laughs> after the initial after the initial after the initial meeting, like I think he'll be totally fine. But he's usually like yeah. kind of all up on people that are all up on him. I don't know why. <laughs> Frank's doesn't like when dogs are on her, but then we'll kind of try to get behind them when they've like like oh I guess we're not smelling each other's asses or whatever. Then she'll try to get under. <laughs> You know, and then be like, no, 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 you can't do it to me, though. And I'm like, Frank, you can't do that. <laughs> like, I talked to her, like, she understands. Like, you can't do that. That's a bitch move. Man, we're, we'll be doing it the rest of our lives, man. Yeah. Um, But no, so something kind of, now that we kind of talked about Anthem Alone a little bit, something, you know, with Kill the Lights, actually, let me back up just a little bit, because this is a question I've posed to TJ, and it kind of, it's an interesting question beyond even just me asking TJ, but I'm really get I get fascinated with people who have spent their, their lives collectively trying to do something or they're known for this one thing. And then kind of later in life when that's not your whole identity anymore, trying to figure out who you are. And so again, like I said, I've not really talked to you about these kind of things. So I would kind of gives me more of an idea of who you are, but when Still Remains kind of broke up, and I know obviously you just said that you and Bone kind of wanted to hop right into something and, and kind of try to hit the ground running, but when it kind of, when you kind of realize maybe Anthem Alone's not taking off, Still Remains is kind of what it is, and it's it's on a hiatus, it's done. What was the process like of you figuring out who you are now? Um, Good question. At that time, um, I had spent so much of my life dedicated towards passion which is amazing like i i'm lucky enough to do that um but i just gotten married and it was i knew it was time to like buck up and make money my wife uh um who's has her doctorate uh was going to school really? good for her yeah yep um and I knew it was time for me basically just to get a job and make some freaking money. On top of that, I also went through some pretty heinous medical stuff. Um, mm. And a few years later, in like 2013, I was diagnosed um, to have a brain tumor. Oh. I, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't even know. Like, so I used to have seizures, like kind of casually. And I say casually in a funny way, because at the time I thought they were panic attacks Um, Mm. until I got into a car accident and 
finally, after the car accident, um, I realized I had blacked out and I didn't had no idea why. Uh, mm. That being said, uh, uh, I actually was being taken to court for how bad the accident was. No one was injured, but because of just the circumstance and how what happened and where I was. So I went to the doctor to get checked out. I was diagnosed um, to have a brain tumor and it was like, it kind of changed my life. Like it really took focus off of, um, off of music, off of anything and everything. And I was just in the moment of being myself and thinking like, these are the last moments of my life. <laughs> Luckily after, um, 11 years after two years now i was diagnosed to be non-life-threatening and mm -hmm. hasn't grown whatsoever so the doctors have even told me like you know i'm gonna live to be an old man like this is just some like something i'm on like just like medication like we all are <laughs> um for seizures but um thankfully it's not life-threatening but that was definitely a process. Like, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I definitely like, I, I stepped away from music thinking I was never going to think about doing it again for a solid seven or eight years. So that's mm -hmm. why I kind of dropped out of the scene originally, but it's one of those things. Like it sounds so scary. Like I had a friend that passed away from brain cancer. Um, I have another really cl close friend that I'm not going to bring it up who it is. Um, but whose son is going through some issues. Um, so, but luckily where I am, like, I, I'm not scared of it whatsoever. Like I, I bring it up and people are usually are shocked or my, like if I tell friends, I like, I see tears in their eyes. I'm like, I'm fine. Like, it's just, um, I, I occasionally have seizures, but it's not one of those things like, People think of uh, what a seizure is. They think grand mal seizure. They, someone's falling on the ground and shaking. It's it's different. It's it's different. Uh, it's more like I space out for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I laugh about it because it's been a part of my life for so long. But um, so that was an, a, a massive part of finding me and finding who I am. And um, I mean, there's nothing more scary than getting an MRI and the doctor telling you you have a brain tumor. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, but, um, no, like, so that kind of, it did stop me in my tracks. I'm not for sure. Hmm. As far as like thinking about music and moving forward in music, but thankfully now I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't take it. Yeah. So don't take that. Me, me saying that, like, thank, thank, god or whoever is you know thanks science or whatever it is um that i'm one of the lucky ones because you know usually you hear about someone being diagnosed with something like that and you know they're dead in six months but right for me it's for me it's uh it's non-cancerous so it's not even not it's not spreading whatsoever and Anyways, cheerio. That's a, there's a fun conversation. To bring up. <laughs> well, I actually haven't talked. I would, I've not talked. I've not talked about that publicly either, by the way. But I, I it's mean, one of those. I yeah. I didn't know that. So I mean, no, only only like family and close friends know. Because again, like so many so many people use like social media to keep bring attention to themselves and bring like sob stories. Um. And when I was originally going like through the diagnosis and all that, I didn't want any of it. I didn't want to, I didn't right. want friends coming to the door and, <laughs> you know, so, but now that I'm in the place where I know, like, you know, my life is fine. Um, I'm in a stable position. Like I openly talk about it. I don't care. Whatever. So I would now knowing that that makes me wonder did that experience inspire you to write something inspire you to be creative? Because I feel like from my perspective, and, and I'm going to say this as, as not someone who 
I feel is capable to like write a song about it or something, but like I would probably find a way to channel it. I would probably podcast about it. Honestly, I would just probably make a seasonal thing where I'm just making like an, an online audio journal of like what I'm going through. And then depending on the outcome of everything, it'd be like, you know, I'm going to release this. Like if I get a clean bill of health or if it's not, then by the way, here's what I'm going through. Here's a literal audio journal of all my highs and yeah. lows of going no. through such a thing. <clears throat> and so to um, me, I, I feel just, like maybe it yeah. inspired you to write a song or something or uh, songs in general. I wish I could say yes, but no. <laughs> On an artistic okay. level, I, I kind of uh, I shut out. Like I didn't, mm. I shut down about. Um, and I wish like, it's funny, like so many like vocalists and some musicians, like they have so much like meaning and passion behind their songs. And I write shit because it sounds cool. <laughs> like i mean i wish i really wish i could say otherwise and give some big grand meaning to it but i'll get a riff in my head like whether it's in the shower or i i write a lot of music when i drive i'm not sure why like mm. i'll get i'll get riffs in, in my head and also let's hear like oh yeah i'll build from there like even um still our main song white walls i wrote um driving back from a festival uh i think it was right before we signed a roadrunner then I get as soon as I got home, I pick, picked up the guitar. So no, not really. It, I I shut down during that time of life, but my writing's random. I'll go like three months without picking up a guitar, and then I'll write two songs in three hours. I don't. I have no idea why. <laughs> it's just like whatever, like inspiration is, whatever, like my I'm feeling at the time. Sometimes it's easy, and usually, like if I can't write a song in ninety minutes, then the song, it's I'll usually throw it out interesting but yeah it's if i have to spend like a I, lot of time thinking about it it's usually hot garbage I, just so throwing even, this out there but i i feel yeah. like hearing you say that makes me wonder what other facets of your life do you apply that kind of same metric to because i feel like again it almost goes back to if it's not of a certain quality, then you're just not willing to to engage in it any longer than you need to because you understand it's not worth it. It's not worth your time at that point. Probably too many. <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> Friendships, cut it off. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Probably too many. I'm surprised but, your marriage has lasted. <laughs> well, I don't think I'd be alive without her. That's why. I don't know how to write checks. I've never written a check in my life. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> what an old person thing to say, checks. <laughs> well, I don't know. How are paying bills? How about that? I don't pay. I, I've never. I, I've never paid a bill in my life. She she takes care of me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think the same oh, thing about I'm, my wife. Anyway. Yeah. From medical issues to like, I don't know how to pay bills. <laughs> Too funny. <laughs> um so with with kill the lights we're i, I kind of want to talk about that obviously because that's sort of why yeah. your publicist team has been really after me to to have someone on the show yes amy so for amy. for me yeah absolutely amy um it's a thing for me where you know something and kind of piggybacking off of the like you know obviously you were trying to do something with Anthem Alone, kind of hit the ground running. That didn't really pan out. Still Remains wasn't really an option for a while. That kind of comes back, but now it's in a lim more limited capacity just due to where everyone is in their lives. And then Kill the Lights kind of came out. Seemingly out of nowhere, but I'm sure like a lot of things like that. It's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes, and when it's ready, then it's, okay, now we're rolling out with everything and it's fucking going. I wanted to know more of... When Kill the Lights started, obviously you have a, you know, with Moose and everybody from Bullet side of things and touring with them so much, you have more of a kinship and, and a friendship and probably more easy goings to make this a band. But what was the process of starting a new band with people you were had toured with, trying to find that that familial bond of, okay, we're starting something together and now we need to learn how to speak this musical language together and also, were there any trepidations of what's the point of this? Because the last two times I've tried doing something, it, it just didn't work out. Like, was there any trepidation on pursuing this in any sort right. of facet? Um, yes, uh, as far as trepidations. Um, 
I have zero expectation to make money from what I do with Kill the Lights. And then that's not saying I don't. Um, I'm really lucky to be in a position where I am where I don't necessarily need to make money from it. Uh, so from a standpoint of I didn't start Kill the Lights um, as a career. I started it as a passion, which is the same reason mm -hmm. why, or I'm sorry, Moose and I didn't start Kill the Lights as a career. We started it as a passion, um, which is the same way Solar Main started, uh, which kind of was the same way Anthem Alone started. Um, as far as uh, how the band started, Moose, Moose had just sent me, it was 20, I can't remember what year it was, 2017 or 2018. And Moose just um, sent me a WhatsApp and said, like, got any riffs? And at that point, I had all the dead Anthem Alone songs. So I sent him, I don't know, 15 songs over the course of a week. Um, and he was super stoked. And that, that same year, Still Remains had a UK tour book. That was kind of our, like, uh, that was us getting back together for a tour. And Moose came out to our show in Bristol. And of course, we like snuck off and went to the bar and we kind of just nodded at each other, like, so what do you think? It's like, well, let's do it. Let's come up with something. Um, and then from there, it was like, it was, I almost thought we were cursed with the Anthem Alone vocal search because mm. him and I like kept quiet for probably about, a, maybe it was six months, eight months um, until finally we found James. Uh, James was in a band that opened up for Bullet. I can't remember what year it was. Um, but he sent us a demo. We had, we had so many demos get sent to us, and some, so many of them were so great. Um, so many of them were hot garbage. Actually, there's one demo <laughs> we were sent. Yeah. There was one demo we were sent where the vocalist is actually off doing some pretty cool shit right now. Um so I'm not going to give him a shout out just because I feel weird. Um, <laughs> Cause I didn't, we didn't accept him into the band. <laughs> we said, no, no I'll, te I'll text, I'll text you. I'll text you my thing and you can text me yours. All right. Sounds good. I, I want to know who um, that is. Yeah, no, he's an incredible vocalist. Uh, he's doing some cool stuff. And we're, we're super happy for him. Um, but yeah, then from there, uh, uh, we had like a trial with bass players where, um, you know, we were swapping out from Davey, uh, who's an amazing dude. I love him to death. Uh, uh, Chris Clancy stepped in for a little bit, mainly during COVID. Um, and finally, we ended up with Jay, which I'm not going to lie. I told Moose from the beginning, like, dude, Jay needs to be in Cover Lights. Um, and they, you know, I th they had a, a a bit of a relationship that was kind of bad, or they needed to heal a little bit, um, mm. just from pa past stuff with with Bullet, or, you know, their last band. And um, it's so great to see them like best friends again, because I mean, some of my favorite memories of my entire life were with those two dudes um, in the states and in Europe and in the United Kingdom. And so it actually kind of hurt, like, in a weird way to see their relationship battered. I say hurt, but you know what I mean. It, it just, it felt wrong. It's like seeing if uh, you and your dog upset each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. Been there. <laughs> but it's, it's so great. Jay, Jay's in such a great, in, in such a great place, like, in with life. Um, he's still the same old dude. He's, um, oddly enough, he's sober, which is, it's, which is amazing for him. He was a sober coach for years. Um, and then as far as Travis goes, actually, we were in studio, uh, writing a recording our first record, the center, and we still hadn't had a solo guitar player. <laughs> so we're recording all the rhythm tracks and all the drums and all the vocals. And we're like, we don't have any solos in these songs. And Chris Clancy, uh, who produced the record along with Colin Richardson, he said, well, I know two guys, there's Travis. Montgomery and this other guy. So he sent us Travis's contact and we DM Travis and we were like, dude, uh, we're in um, Blackpool, England. You want to fly out and record some solos? And he was there like a week later. <laughs> it 
it's all history. It's all history from there. So, but it's weird. It was kind of like a bit of a hodgepodge throw together, but now like I can't imagine any other dudes to be making music with. And yeah, it's fun. It's, I mean, I, I wish we toured more, which, well, there will be some announcements coming up, but actually, our, and speaking of which, our first record was kind of thrashed because we COVID. recorded the record COVID. Yeah. I mean, Moose and I paid for the entire first record on our own, you know, obviously flights and the hotel and mixing the first video, um, everything. I mean, so we were like, again, thankfully we were lucky enough to be in a position to pay for it, but I'm sorry, Moose James also did as well. Uh, but then we took the record without a record deal. We, it was completely finished. We approached fearless and uh, that's, I guess they, I don't want to say they bought it from us, but they essentially paid us back from us. Licensed and, it. <laughs> licensed it. And then, but then that was January of 2020, was it? I believe yes. so, yeah. So that's right around the time I got Frankie. Yep. And we had just announced our signing and COVID hit two months later. So we had sat on the record for about I'm not, I want to say a year and a half or a year before actually signing and then COVID hit. So yeah. And then we ended up releasing the record like mid COVID. Cause at that time, like we had no idea, like, was this going to last 10 years or another six months? Right. So timing, man, I say timing is everything bad times. Yeah. <laughs> to get a record deal. <laughs> uh. Well, I think that creates sort of an interesting thing now for you because like, you know, I've COVID was an interesting time for me doing this because some people, you know, sat on records, obviously, excuse me, yeah. some people, you know, did the live stream thing. Some people put out records and then couldn't tour them. And there's been some interesting chats I've done with some people where they're putting out basically their first record like you guys can't tour it, can't do anything for it. Now here you are, new records about to come out. And yeah, you've played a handful of shows, but like it's not like you got to properly tour the last album. And now you're no. about ready to put out a new record, potentially new touring opportunities, so on and so forth. And now, like the question I like to ask is, how do you figure out what a set list looks like? Because no it's one hard. really has gotten to hear the old right. record. You didn't really get to support it. So you might go back through as you're preparing a set list and going, Oh man, it'd be really cool to hear this. It'd be really, really cool to play this song. And it's not like there's a ton of singles or fan favorites, quote unquote, from a live setting. So at this point, I feel like you're sort of, it's almost like a, a Sophie's choice. So like, well, fuck, we really could play anything because we haven't really yeah. gotten to play a ton. All the old, the quote unquote old songs are still new. Cause we didn't they you know wear them into the ground in a live setting. So I right. feel like it's always interesting to be like, how do you navigate essentially a new quote unquote new band in a live setting where you have two albums worth of material, but not a lot of people have gotten to see it live. For us, it's pretty easy for, we base it off of songs we like and streams. So, hmm. I mean, you can look at Spotify numbers and Apple music and YouTube numbers and so figure you out what don't songs. play those songs. <laughs> What's that? It's when you don't play those songs? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, don't play those songs. Nah, I'll play those. I mean, <laughs> a lot of those songs are our favorites, though, too. Some of them we don't. Some of them we don't play. Um, but and then some of the set songs we pick are obviously our favorites. But being that we only have two records written, like it isn't that hard for us to come up. And we're not headlining tours or looking to headline tours at this point. So. I mean, finding out seven or eight songs is pretty easy. Would Do you think you'll get to the point where maybe, well, I don't know if you guys have to be so stuck to a, a grid of, you know, it live on a track or whatever to keep the show going. But as I say, at that point, it'd be kind of fun maybe to like, if your set is usually seven to eight, maybe have 12, 12 or 13 that you have and know. So you can just audible on the fly, but be like, you know what? I think the song's going to do really good right here. We should fucking play this. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, most of the songs give me 30 minutes and even if I haven't played it in two years, usually give me 30 minutes and it's on the fly, but we'll see. Actually, this still remains set has proven to be or the two sets that we have for Grand Rapids has proven to be a little difficult because we tried to pull some songs out of the box. And yesterday we had our first rehearsal for the shows and God damn, some of the, some of the takes were bad <laughs> from me. I'm not, I mean, other guys, I'm not speaking for anyone else, <laughs> uh, whether they were good or bad, but digging up a song you haven't played in, I don't know, eight or nine years. It's hard to even the room. You know, I don't listen to the songs regularly. Dude, I think that's like one of the weird things about playing guitar is like something as mediocre as I am at playing guitar. Like I can learn, like I'll try to learn something and I'll get it pretty quickly. Like I can be like, oh, it's this, and then it's this, and then it's this, it's these chords. But like, I will forget it just as fast as I can learn it. And that's also how I kind of write. Like I'll try to write something and I'm like, oh, this riff's cool. And then maybe I'll add like, I'll do something else or I'm like, oh, I need like a tag to get me to the somewhere else or whatever. Like, right. where is this going? And then right. usually maybe the other thing, the other thing I stumble across isn't like, it might be like a completely different time, all this kind of shit. And then I'm like, well, that sounds cool. And then I completely forget what I just spent 45 minutes trying to figure out, like working on a riff and getting it somewhere. And I'm like, no, this is the thing now. And I'm like, fuck, why did like, why does my brain do that? Like, why can I be like, okay, for 30 minutes, I'm doing this and this riff and I can just play it end, end, endlessly. And I got do, it. Do you and then I'll change one thing. I, tr I try to, but then it's like, I, I've i never had lessons and stuff like that. So like, I'm not somebody, like when someone's like, I jam with people on a drums a long, long time ago. And this is like, it's always stuck with me. Cause I was like, I don't ever want to be a musician like this because I feel like it takes away the feeling. Like I remember playing, like I sat behind drums cause I could at least keep a beat sort of and i remember the guys going okay uh the guitar guy playing guitar goes you like to the other guitar player he's like P call out a letter guy was like g and then he was like points to the bass guy he's like what about you he's like f and then he's like all right uh <laughs> i've never heard it right and then this is how you wrote, wrote songs so, and that well no that was he was like okay so we're gonna jam the, the chord progression is gonna be these three chord progressions and we just kind of figure things out from there and part of me was just like that's I don't like that. Like, I don't like the fact that you can just be like, <laughs> like, I know. Yeah. I know what these are like these, these notes or whatever, but it's like, there's no feeling to that. And there's no spontaneity well, necessarily. And it may work for but some it's a people. Thing where, sure. But the thing is, is like, if you were to tell me like, go play a G chord, I'd probably be like, uh. but like, if you were to show it to me, like, Oh yeah, that it's that chord or it's this chord or it's right. this chord or it's this, or it's this, like I could do it. I just don't know the names. And I feel like that's right. part of my why songwriting is so hard for me because it's like I will get lost where it's like someone else could be like, oh, OK, I'm playing a minor scale uh, and it's in this. So, OK, now this is where I should go. I can go within this parameters and that should sound good and work and then find something within it. However, you play it from there. But to me, again, like right. it's just not there's no soul to that. It's just kind of formulaic at that point. It can be. Uh and usually, like for me, I, I'm never writing a song unless I'm recording it at the same time. Uh, so usually by the time I'm done writing a song, I have no idea how to play it because I'm writing <laughs> I'm writing the, I suppose, what I call my riff. And then I think, okay, well, what would the other guitar be doing? Obviously, other members in my Travis and Mike Church, obviously, they write their own parts, so I'm not taking credit for any of that um but so i'm writing my part i'm writing what i think would be their part at the same time and the song's over and usually i'll leave it alone i'll step away the next day come back and press play and if i like it and i think it's good i'm like i i know we'll use it if i don't like it i delete it <laughs> but but then then the next day i like it and i'm like my hands were all warmed up by the end of the session I sit down to play it and I'm like, I can't fucking play this. <laughs> so it's always like a struggle then to relearn the riffs the next day. But I, I should have you over some time. It'd be fun. It'd be fun, have, it'd be fun a, to uh Oh, you think it would be fun. It would be awful. <laughs> no, I'm saying to show you I'm to show someone else oh, how okay. I write songs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that would be interesting to me. I always find that that 
process very interesting, um, especially going from demo, pre-pro, the di like. I knew we were gonna. I knew we were gonna talk about this band, and I just wasn't sure how we we're gonna get there. But here we are. Him, if you listen to like all yeah. the different versions of their songs, like how they have, you know, like a song like uh, "Buried Alive by Love" or "Buried Alive by You," like the yeah. ways that they will mix different things. The way there's like fuzz on the bass on this one, fuzz on the guitar on this one. Drums come in differently, different lyrics, different melodies, and so forth. Like to where like sometimes with some of their songs, acoustic versions, like you might have seven different versions of the same song and they don't sound any like they sound similar right. but there's different intricacies intricacies of each one that make it stand out and make it unique unto itself to where like when i listen to some of them i'm like i mean there it is that's the song but then you hear it as it is as the final product you're like well i don't know that's the song and it's interesting how right. different choices you make in the process of making a song totally change everything like it can change the whole dynamic different it can make the song yeah, suck. Different, different studios different vibes and i guess what they were thinking at the time there's a still remain song sleepless nights alone was definitely yeah. me wanting to, wanting to write a song uh i wasn't i didn't borrow riffs from him i'm not gonna say like you know every band like you take inspiration from but it was definitely me being like all right i'm set out to write a song that has that hymn sound I'm a massive him fan. I always have been. You know, it's always so weird because uh, at the time, like in the late 2000s in the UK, I feel like the metalheads looked at him like, um, I don't know, like metalheads look at Morgan Wallen. And I, so I'd be wearing like him, <laughs> him, him t shirts or hoodies. And everyone would be like, why? You're in a metal bit, yeah. Nice. See, yeah, I, I already saw a poster in the background there too, by the way. Um, yep, dark light, but hell yeah. But they did come up to me like, Why are you wearing like you're in a metal band? Why are you wearing a him t shirt? I'm like, Psh, they're in, in the states, like, I mean, they weren't looked at as a pop band, but for some reason over there, they kind of were. I, I have no idea why. Absolutely, they were, yeah, but yeah, to. I still actually my major regret to this day is that I didn't make it to the VV concert in Grand Rapids. It was interesting. Actually, both both shows I saw, the one in Detroit on the first leg of the tour, his solo tour, the headlining tour, and then opening for or direct support for Blackville Brides. It was so weird because like the Detroit one. Actually, I'm gonna take it a step further because like I'm gonna I'm gonna really nerd out on some him shit real quick because like I don't really get to do it a whole lot. And they're one of my favorite bands of all time. And Absolutely. so I remember getting I remember getting to see actually speaking of this show. So right before they did the the Dark Light record, uh they had basically put out in Love Said No and slash love metal it was like kind of around that same like year and a half uh span, and they had come to the States for the first time. Excuse me. Actually, hold on just a second. I'll pull up this relic. Sure. Meanwhile, AJ is calling me right now. I'll tell him to fuck off. So this, um, this for those, oh, nice. and I know I got a wicked glare, was from the first time I got to see him. They did like a 20-date tour around Love Metal uh, back in 04. And the cool thing about it was they started like they had a set list and this is kind of where i was saying like calling out songs and villa i remember just kind of being like it seems like you guys know a lot more of our material than we were anticipating if there's songs you want to hear shot them out and if we know it we'll play it so we kind of got to like curate our own set list of sorts which i don't know if like Amazing. and maybe they like maybe they bullshitted and maybe the songs they ended up playing it was like oh okay like we we're already gonna play these but we we're acting like we weren't <laughs> I have no idea. I wasn't close uh, enough to see the set list. But. They probably were bullshitting. <laughs> I hope that they probably. I, not. I'm assuming. I hope not. <laughs> but I don't know. That's 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 incredible. I, but it was a thing where like that tour, that show was full of fans that were like clearly ahead of like Viva La Bam, CKY. Like you know, we're not Bam Margera fans who were adjacent to him fans. It was legit. These are fans of this band came here to see this band and we're very excited that they finally were over here in the states 
the Dark Light Tour, that's when they had blown up. Wings of a Butterfly was huge. It was on MTV. It was on radio. And like suddenly now they're playing to a room that's like twice the size of the room I saw them in initially. And it didn't feel like people were really like fans. It just felt like they were like, oh, this is the cool thing. Like you saw a lot of like oh, weird element skateboard shit. Like it just fe- it wasn't. I don't know. That's the only way I could describe it. It just felt like it was like half the real fans and half fans that were new in like the last Wait, like, what, six to eight months. What, what venue did, did you originally see them in? Uh, I saw them in St. Andrews. St. Andrews. Oh, God. Yeah, I, that's a amazing setting. But and then yeah, I, the, the next venue, time I saw them I, at their collect tour, it was the Fillmore. Okay. Uh, the, I, the first time I saw them was I can't, a festival in Germany during the day. And it was, it was hmm. again, a weird like setting. Rock and Ring or Rock and Park? I honestly can't remember. But there was... I'm not sure. 30, 40,000 people there. It was, it was kind of a weird setting. Cause same thing. Like I was so into the songs and everyone else around me didn't really seem to give a shit. I'm not sure if it's just cause <laughs> where I was standing or I don't know, but props to him. Like they're one of those bands. I feel like should live on forever, do live on forever, but it's few and far between where you find someone like you or I who like still gives a shit about them. Oh dude. James Hart and I, we haven't in a while, but that dude and I would just go back and forth with like him records because it feels like a, a thing where you're just like for a while, like he and I were like, I remember when he was like my favorite him record straight up deep shadows. And I was like, that's, that's a fucking mine's, bold statement. Like I go, too. you have to be, a, you have to be a, you have to be a huge him fan to really appreciate what deep shadows is because it's, it's sort of the outlier, but to me it's, it's, it's the record I think marries the best of what they do. Yeah, Deep Deep Shadows is my favorite him record. Absolutely. I mean, like front to back, you know. Obviously, there's certain yeah. songs on different records that may be my favorite, but I've always said Deep Shadows is one. I'll never forget on my 21st birthday in London. Actually, Mike Church, we were at a bar fly. And he was DJing and he dedicated a song to me. And oh God, what the fuck? It was off of Deep Shadows. I can't remember what song it was because obviously I was drinking. But pretending. Yeah, him. What's that? Was it pretending? <laughs> might have been, dude. I don't. It might have been. I'll, I'm going to have to text. I'll text Church right after Joy this, and but... sorrow. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember, but no, they're. Such a great band. I remember even uh, the Killswitch guys are massive him fans. I know Joel has uh, the Hardogram tattoo. tattoo so does Ho- yeah. Hojo. Does he? Okay, I didn't know that. I, I knew Joel did. Yep. Yeah, I. Uh, it's so funny because I feel like when you find people who are into him, like you're just like, it's almost like a weird fraternity where you're like, fuck yeah. And you're like, yeah, they're <laughs> great, aren't they? Yeah, For they sure. are. For sure. And I mean, that's like for me, like, I know I had sent you a bunch of the videos uh, when I saw them in Detroit. And to me, like a song I always wanted to hear and I just never got to because they just didn't play shit off of that record was when they played When Love and Death and Brace off of uh, the first record. And I was like, mm. yo, this is fucking dope. Like, granted, would it have been cool to hear like Silicon Diabali or some like other like weird deep cuts? Like for sure. But like When Love and Death and Brace, like it's like, the most typo negative song that band ever wrote that typo never wrote. Right. And that's another band I've been really fucking fixated on. Like the last like two or three dudes back in the day, everyone told me like my main, like doppelganger people said was Peter Steele. I'm like Peter Steele. Peter Steele had like, (laughs) no, I mean, there was sort of an era and this is something I've really been fascinated by as I kind of been, just digging into anything I can find of different eras, interviews, live footage and so forth. But Peter still kind of had like three looks in my mind. There's the classical, like he's wearing that, like, like the, uh, I call it the Castro hat, like that green, like, like fatigue, <laughs> like Castro hat. Right. And yeah. then his like green shirt and like, you know, black pants. There was sort of like right after he got out of carnival in the beginning, the phase I just talked about. And then there's like my favorite phase when he had the fucking mustache, like right at toward the end. <laughs> right. The and like, stage. that's 
Yeah. Yeah, that was always kind of like my favorite era of 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 uh, typo. But like just listening to so much of their records lately and seeing live performances, like you know, like a song like "Love You to Death" or like I mean, honestly, anything off of that fucking record, like just is like the sonics of it for that time frame. Like when you listen to you're like the bass tone is just so undeniably unique and it's almost like a lead instrument. Like it kind of reminds me of like what tool does where it flips instead of the bass being a rhythm instrument, it's more of a lead instrument and the guitar is playing more of a, a rhythm hmm. until a solo I, comes and stuff like that. It kind of flips the, the structure on its head a little bit like that. Hmm. I, I, I honestly, I know a few type of songs. Like they're one of those bands I've never like really. Mm. Like I, I know them, but for some reason I just haven't gotten into their catalog at all. You're missing out, dude. I'm I'm gonna I'll, I'll text you the, uh, the when I met Billy for the first time was at the Roadrunner United show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and shit, shit housed. <laughs> oh yeah, well we all were. Uh, Go figure. It was one of those one of those moments where I was like, dude, can I get a picture with you? And I have a picture with him, and it was like. For some reason, whatever face I'm making, like I, I don't show any in the picture because I look like I'm half like <laughs> take the. <laughs> but he was cool as hell, man. He he flew in just to do what two songs, one song. He did he only did one song. He did yeah, he did black number one. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun. Talk about being starstruck with it. I think I was twenty. I was to say yeah. I want to talk about that. Since you just brought it up and it's celebrated its twentieth yeah. anniversary or twenty fifth, twentieth, maybe twentieth. I'm old no, enough now that I forget what it is. Maybe I was nine. I must have been nineteen. I'm thirty eight now. I'm about to turn thirty nine. Okay, um, so I got about a year on you then. Okay, right. Because I'll be four. Oh, dude, that's year, that, so. If you're turning the nine, that sh that that show and that tour, or not not tour, but the studio session was wild for me because how do, let me back up just a second let me cut you off how did you get involved in that what was like walk me through the process of how you got involved in that project so joey jordanson um rob flynn dino, dino and matt and matt heafy were like the leaders of that record and mm -hmm. uh we had just done our first tour with roadrunner we did um i'm sorry our second we did the road rage tour in the uk and europe i got on from the tour and our a and r and agent mike gitter Gitter, yep mr gitter, gitter. sorry love love the gitter. i gotta get him on the podcast um, if he'll ever do it oh dude yeah gitter's great gitter's great he's a great dude to talk to it you you have to get him on i'll, I'll text him after this um no but he called me and he's like dude like uh rob flynn just called me and he wants you to come record some songs with him I'm like, huh? And I was like 19. You got to think like a year, a year to eight months before this, Still Remains was just a local band. And next thing you know, Gitter's calling me saying like, Rob wants you to fly out to San Francisco to record a few songs with him. I had no idea like what that meant at the time and who was going to be on the songs. Um, I got in the studio and Rob said, Yo, okay, so Corey from Slipknot is going to be on this one. Howard from Kill Switch is going to be the, on this one. And uh, at the time he was saying, oh, God damn it, singer VOD. I feel like a dickhead for not knowing his name right now. Um, VOD? Yes. Um, and Max Cavalera. Keith, Keith Caputo, is the only, Caputo is the only one coming to my mind, and I know that he wasn't on any of the tracks you guys did. Oh, I feel like. And Max from Soulfly and um, Supple Turtles can going to be in this one. And I'm just, like trying to like the whole thing was that you try to play it cool because you're like you're amongst friends. Right. But I was shit in my pants. Peers. The time. <laughs> yeah. Peers. Friends. I mean, I'm in studio like feeling like I'm shaking, but trying to act like normal. And what was even more of a mind fuck was when we did the actual show. Because um, we got on to rehearse um, the dagger, and the the drummer Andals who played drums on it was in was going to fly in the next day, so he wasn't able to make it to rehearsals. And so mm. Joey Joey um, 
jump behind the kit. He's like, oh, I've heard this song before. And at that same time, I'm like, holy shit, I'm about to be on stage with one of the best drummers in the world, the best drummer, metal drummer in the world, Joey Jordanson. And Corey walks on stage. And I'm, again, 19 years old. Um, not really sure how to act or what to say to these guys. And I actually feel like I wish one of my big regrets from back then is I wish I was open and honest about being a fan of the musicians that I was around because I would always be like, play it cool. Like they're around fans. They don't want someone asking for an autograph. They don't want people asking for pictures. But I mean, honestly, like, like those guys, like they're so like way more down to earth than any of us, than anyone even thinks, you know, people put musicians again, put musicians up on a pedestal and think like um they're superhuman they don't want to be talked to like about this song or ask the question about this but yeah they do they fucking love it <laughs> so i so Corey came on stage like what's Matt? what's up man i'm Corey. i shook his hand said my name and that's all i ever i think that's all i ever spoke to the guy but mm. no, it was a wild experience absolutely especially for being so young I wish I could relive it now. You can on DVD. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It's actually, one of those things where, like, I don't I don't think I've ever actually seen the full thing because, like, the VHS, maybe it came out on DVD originally, but I feel like it was a VHS at first because it's around that time where, like, VHS to DVD was, like, still like are we doing this are we going over here we're not sure dvds when they came Bro. out were like 30 40 dollars and like by the not way cheap we sound old as fuck right now i know <laughs> <laughs> it's okay vhs I, uh, and DVDs. yeah well um, i'll get on that i'll we'll talk about that later on i'll talk i'll talk about how i think it's interesting how <laughs> if you really look at technology it's always followed the uh porn industry porn industry always sets what the mainstream is going to do for their technology moving forward. You can debate me all you I want. want. Talk about, I, I, I'm not going to debate you. I don't know if I want to talk about that. No. <laughs> I'm just saying like they were like porn was the first to start going to, to the online thing and doing clips that you could watch. What did everyone else start doing with music and so forth? They started doing clips that you could hear and then buy the records. When everyone started doing streaming and all this kind of stuff, who was the first to kind of start doing that porn? Porn was the first to go to VHS. Porn was the first to go to DVD. They always kind of set the standard of what the rest of the mainstream industry is going to use as like their new form of like whatever for to to get to the audience that they want to get to. Look You're at Patreon. Patreon right. was what <laughs> Patreon was one of the first things that like independent performers would start using. Band people started doing it. Cause then it's like, hey, sign up. You can hear demos before their things. You could get exclusive merch. Da 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 da. Like it's a lot of the industry, a lot of the mainstream entertainment industry owes a lot to the porn industry. And they just will never, ever fucking admit that. And I know that, like I said, <laughs> that's a very weird thing. Uh, but that is something that I've noticed uh, just being an observer of things. Um, but I like it. all that said, I, I enjoy, um, I, enjoy the, I enjoy the theory, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about I can it. Back it up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just uh, the last one of the last episode I just posted this week as we're recording, we somehow got to talking about uh the pimp slash cuck chairs in the hotels and why they're a thing. And then we started talking about cuck riders, <laughs> like what would be on your oh cuck God. rider to watch watch your partner get banged out? Like what would you need on oh your rider to, to do that? Nothing. N no, <laughs> never. I'm, all right, I'm, le I'm leaving. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, blinders. <laughs> Um, uh. but no, actually, that's a that's a fun thing because like you know, you guys were kind of at the, the tail end of the, the record industry being what it was before it switched from physical media to digital to kind of what it is now, where it's I don't know what because no one seemingly knows what the industry is or where it's going or how it works. Um, if they ever yeah, did the, yeah, the first time we toured the road in our office, I mean God, I don't know how many staff they had. 50, 60? <laughs> and then crazy. probably what? I think based on, if they my were... memory's right, about three to four years later, most of the staff was gone. 
Yeah, it was devastating. They they had a office in or a state or yeah, an office in the UK, which we were super close with, still are actually with a lot of the staff. Um, office in Germany, Japan, and then all of a sudden, I can't remember what year, like all their jobs were just terminated instantly, and it was I think sad. Two thousand six or seven or eight, somewhere in there. I think if I'm not, I remember it being around like Slipknot's Volume Three. Is when the big ships started happening I, over there. I think it was no, because we were with them until 2008. I think I want to say it was 2010 or 2011. Okay, Just my because, time might be off, obviously. Yeah, but but I was going to yeah, ask, it, what was it like to be signed to Roadrunner? Because the the reason I wanted to bring it up is because at the time that you guys signed, that was like sort of when labels fucking mattered like you could just see roadrunner trust kill fucking ferret like you would see these labels and they meant something where you might not have heard a single note of music but you go oh that label put it out i'm picking it up because i know it has that recognition behind it and i feel like you were in especially for roadrunner right at the tail end when roadrunner meant something to the metal community like they were a tastemaker essentially right and a lot of people don't know this, but one of the ma- one of a band that most people fucking hate that they should thank is Nickelback. Dude, and then Slipknot printed money for that label. Dude, everyone always says everyone at Roadrunner, and so many metal fans are gonna like, turn the podcast off. Nickelback that Roadrunner says that Nickelback was one of the best things that happened to heavy metal. Reason being. Not because Nickelback is necessarily my favorite band. They funded, Nickelback funded um, so many metal bands. Still Remains, I'm not saying that word, great. Um, Agony Scene, Trivium, Kill Switch Engage. And I'm not saying that those bands didn't go on to, obviously they went on, and they would have done something without that funding. Right. But... Roadrunner was able to go out and invest so much money on young bands because of that. Some of those bands went on to go do amazing, great things, and some of them put out one record and broke up. But there's a lot, you know, I don't mind Nickelback. They helped me out. <laughs> I don't mind them at all. You know who um, else did that for a diff- completely different label, though, that a lot of people probably, I feel like people listening to this podcast probably would know this, but you know who probably did that for Metal Blade? Metal Blade. Bullet, a oh, metal blade. Let me know their trust kill. I can't think of them right now. Goo Goo Dolls. That first oh, Goo Goo Dolls record was on Metal Blade. I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Well, no, I, I know that the what record was long way down. Long way down. That first record was on that? Metal Blade. Wow, that's crazy. Goo Goo yeah. Dolls, Metal Blade. Yeah, because they were they were a punk band mm-hmm. originally, weren't they? Yeah. They were like a yeah. Like a punk hard rock band. Great. Fucking love that, that band too. <laughs> I do too, and I wish that guy would stop having surgery. Oh my god! His, like I was trying yeah. to figure out if he has or it's just hor- like I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't I mean, know. I, I as an bad. ugly dude, I, I just don't have that kind of money to fix my own face. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. Yeah, I don't nah, have, man, I don't I'm have Johnny about... Resnick money. <laughs> I like I like the idea of aging gracefully. Yeah. Um I hope yeah. I like I like people that do as well. But anyways, once <laughs> we won't get into that. Um but yeah, no, sorry to cut you off like talking about Roadrunner and stuff like that and just what it yes, means to be a yeah. part of that label. No, it's it was incredible. It obviously it felt like it was a godsend. <laughs> It's pretty like so originally like the music industry I've always said no one's interested till everyone's interested. And then mm-hmm. and that's what Still Remains felt like. We were just a local band who found a manager and our manager gave our EP, If Love Was Born to Die, to one record label and they said wow, well, we think we could do something with this. Um, our manager then said to a different 
Asia and record label. Well, so-and-so said they think they can do something with this. What do you think? And then next thing you know, we had, I can't remember if it was seven or eight offers on the table. And with the money and name that Roadrunner had, they were an easy choice. And actually one of the labels like threatened to sue us because they thought we were leading them on for a better deal. No, we weren't. To, it was to drive up the comp, the price of somebody else. Yeah. And no, we were not. I'll, I'm not going to say it here, but <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you later. Yeah. They All threatened right. our One lawyer. Question, thought, how, yeah. how close were you? Cause to me, if I, if I was back in the day of like a, a label bidding war, I would have probably guessed you would have gotten a solid state tooth and nail. Like, was that ever an option for you guys? Cause it seems like yeah. a lot of your contemporaries were, like that's who was picking them up. So it seemed like you would have followed suit. So it yeah. was kind of a surprise. I remember when you guys signed a roadrunner and not them. Um, it was an option. Yeah. We, we talked with Chad and toured their office on, I can't remember what tour we were on pace today, I think. And they were Sounds awesome. Right. I mean, solid state would have been also a great spot for still remains. But I think back then, again, with the stigma and everything that, comes behind the name roadrunner we were we were caught up in that and we were with just a bunch of kids so we were looking at slipknot and kill switch engage and <laughs> but ultimately runner road runner one just there the staff and the label was just it was impressive to be honest with you back then what they could bring to the table and there are other aspects of it too obviously they had a lot of money to throw around but no i think overall they i don't regret not going with them whatsoever they were they were an amazing label with incredible staff so kind of not that i want to wrap this up because i, I could talk, keep talking for a while but i usually know like at the hour and a half mark is like sort of the threshold where a lot of people are like eh, that's that's where it probably needs to start winding down um, something I kind of want to ask you, and again, it kind of goes off of something we were talking about earlier, but, you know, talking about, we were talking about getting older earlier, you know, you're about to be 39 this year, you know, you got a new record with kill the lights coming out. You're doing these shows with still remains, you know, we've been kind of talking about Anthem alone and stuff like that. Like just kind of the whole breadth of your career at this point, a, what does still remains mean to you now that it's not that it doesn't have to be the main thing for you, like financially, like career wise and all that. And secondly, what are you most appreciative of, of still being in the, the music industry and getting to create music and, and touring and stuff like that? What does it mean to you now having been doing it for so long at this point, most of your life? Um, mainly with still remains. It's about friendship. Like those dudes are my best fucking friends. Like I would die for any one of them. Um, if I wasn't friends with them, there's no way in hell I'd be playing shows. I, I mean, like I said, AJ was calling me during this um, podcast or whatever, and sorry, I text. I te what's that? I said sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, I'm feel saying like that. That that's how often I talk to those. I I talk to them every single day. They're they're like my brothers, literally. Like those. I'd do anything for those guys. Um, so mainly with Still Remains, it's about friendships. Like, And what comes with that is almost like when we do shows, it's kind of like a family reunion. Uh, we all get to see each other. We get to see each other's kids. Um, our wives all get to see each other because they're all friends. Um, um, and coming back to the music industry, like, it's interesting. You get to see the bullshit again. Like, <laughs> there's, there's so, there's, oh, I love ooh, it. You you said you were gonna call out or tell me a story about some bullshit you dealt with uh, when you guys were doing the Kickstarter for or the GoFundMe or whatever for ceasing to breathe. I'll tell you about. It just reminded me. So, oh, you okay? I'll tell you about that separately. <laughs> but okay. there's so much. There's there's so much. There's so much like uh, the music industry is kind of sad, to be honest with you. Like, I think everyone knows that. 
it, it preys on people's passion and on what people love to do. And then as soon as you are burnt out and you've made someone a little bit of money or you've made someone a lot of money, I mean, the next best thing is waiting because it's like puppy dogs in a shelter. Like what all you want to do is get out. All you want to do is see the world. So with Kill the Lights, obviously it's been an amazing ride, an amazing blast, but it's also like weird to see the bullshit as a 39 year old, 38 year old, <laughs> as opposed to a 19 year old. Because back then I didn't have money. I didn't care. I didn't, I didn't, I needed money, but didn't really need money. Like, you know, we, we would we you toured. say, would you say it's self worth and understanding what your value actually is as a person and as a, as a business person? Like, has grown or what do you mean? Like, so maybe in the way that this came to my head, just, just literally now is, you know, you're talking about being 19 and versus 39, that's 20 years difference, 19, you're willing to maybe be fed a line of bullshit and Hey, take this contract. Cause it's probably going to be the best thing you get. Yeah. Okay. It probably will be oh, sure. Versus now 20 years later, you're like, no, because I have more value in myself. I believe in what I'm doing and I'm not just going to take the first thing that comes to me because it may not be the most valuable thing. Maybe if I wait, I will see my return of investment yeah. of waiting longer. That's kind of more yeah. what I meant I'll, is just understanding right. that like your self-worth internally to not just be like, yeah, I'll take this just because it gets me what I want. Absolutely. Obviously with age comes wisdom and, I think what really burned still remains out was we would just take any and every tour we got and we would tour for nine months a year. And after what, four years of it, we just, we were done we were living in a 15 passenger van in the States. And then obviously in a bus and overseas, it was, it was just too much. And so I guess these days what's nice with kill the lights is, We've all been there and done that and we can pick and choose what tours we do and what don't want to do. And like what we actually think is a good investment of time versus what we don't. So, yeah, I don't know. It's different. It's fun. It's, <laughs> but the music industry is rough. And so I feel, I feel so bad for some young bands starting out and I want them I wish I could talk to these kids, these youngins, and give them advice, but I wouldn't want to discourage them in any way. But I guess for younger bands out there, just make sure you're in it for the right reasons. Make sure you're in it for yourself, for fulfilling your passions. Uh, and don't think you're going to get signed to a label and make a million dollars right away. You can, <laughs> but here, here's an interesting last question. You just made me think of something. So as of when we're recording this, you just went and saw, presumably I'm, I'm presuming, uh, got to see Ronnie Radke, uh, and falling in reverse open for that disturbed tour. Cause I, I actually, feel like I've seen through uh, good. I did. I actually did not make it to that show. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was but. gonna say, I know at upheaval when they headlined uh, and through seeing and kind of like it's the power of social media is like when you follow certain people, you can see the comments they leave on things. And it's almost like the highlighted comment. Cause you're like, Oh, I follow that person. So I can see their comments. Um, but it seems like you are on a, a friendly rapport with Ronnie. So I was going to say, just seeing someone like that, who is kind of unapologetically, forge their own path in this industry knowing the bullshit that exists in it to seeing someone like that who sticks to their guns and just kind of is who they are and makes the music they want does that inspire you or give you the permission for lack of a better term to do the same good question um i think uh i'm a lot more shy with uh things i think <laughs> uh okay as far as uh i don't know I, I honestly i've had nothing but good interactions with that guy i'm i fucking love his music i think he's an incredible musician 
Um, Pause for just. A I live, By the way, how did you? Yeah. How did you? How did you guys even cross paths? Because I don't know that story either. Uh, I, to be honest, I think technically I don't know if we ever have. Um, okay. I know that uh, Ronnie uh, was a Still Remains fan. Is a Still Remains fan. Um, okay. He's definitely cheered me along the way with Kill the Lights. Um, and I mean, we've met, but I honestly, I, I can't claim to know the guy. Like, obviously, like he's, I can text him and say what up, but it's not like I've, I'm friends with the dude. <laughs> as, as like, I right. mean, I just think I think it's dumb. Like, I've met so many people in the industry over the years. I've recorded songs with, again, Corey Taylor. I'm not, I don't know a guy whatsoever. You know, I might see him in a crowd or backstage somewhere, and he might recognize my face, but. No, Ron, I, Ronnie's actually just, he's been a massive, a massive supporter of anything I've ever done. Um, mm. And so because of that, like, and I've just, I got to respect, I got to respect that he's respected my hustle, you know, it's, and I think he's just an incredible vocalist is to be honest, he is. Um, but as far as like, you know, I always say like, I have so many friends and, they're associated with, uh, let's just say politics or something like someone's a Democrat or someone's a Republican. You can be outspoken. I think people should value their own opinions and be able to feel free and vocalize what they think about things. Personally, for me, I don't like <laughs> I I don't. I mean, he's a very vocal dude, which by all means, yeah. if you want to be if you want to be vocal be vocal. Um, so that's his thing and, and good for him for being vocal for himself, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> does that sum up any like, no, I mean, I think for me, like it, it's funny because like, this is always part of like, it's always part of the, like doing this where I, I kind of revert inward um, because I know the relationships that I have with people that I've done this show with and that are my actual friends and, and the relationship we have, but I feel like at times when I try to, and, and I do it a lot with the show and, you know, having gone to therapy, I know it's a, a form of imposter syndrome for me where I don't feel like I belong in the same realm as some of these people because i'm like i didn't do this thing i'm not this person i'm not these things but that there still is just the understanding that we're people at the end of the day and and that people can be gravitated toward others and you can be like you were just saying completely opposite thinking yeah. on certain things but if you find the commonality between you like that's what you know supports the friendship now that said like it gets to a point at times like where it's i mean I'm going to drop a name. So like, you know, we have people coming up uh, here in Grand Rapids locally in a couple of months. And it's usually like friends of friends, like people I've made friends with over doing this and just meeting people in the touring industry and shit. And it's always a good hang for me because it's minutes from my house. So like, I don't give a shit. Like I'll just go and hang out with my friends because it's that close and I enjoy it. But like the other day, you know, I had a, I'd had a Shannon from Godsmack on this podcast a while ago and surprisingly really hit it off with the dude to where like when we were done, he was like, we talked for another like hour after we were done recording and then was like, hey, man, we should Amazing. keep in touch. And I'm like, yeah, like I'll I guess I'll send you my information to your publicist. And he's like, no, just take down my number right now. And I was like, oh, OK, it's awesome. I don't really text the dude hardly ever because I'm like, you're pro and that's my thing. I'm always like any touring people. I'm like. You're probably busy as shit. I'm not gonna bother you, so I'm just not ah, going to. They don't care. No, and 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 I've learned that too, so I'm getting yeah. better at that. But like, I texted Shannon. I was like, "Hey, I just I saw you guys are playing upheaval. You're minutes from my house. Can't wait to fucking hang out with you, like for real in person, because we haven't gotten to do that." Sent it. Didn't hear anything back for like a week, and I was like, "Ah, okay, it happens." And then he sent me a text dude, like I yesterday. He was like. And he was like, hey, dude, sorry, I just saw this. We've been really deep in rehearsals. I can't fucking wait to hang out with you. 
hit me up a day before you and your wife or whoever, like you're going to be on my guest list. We're hanging. And I was like, cool. And it's I'm, like a I'm, thing where I'm, like, even if, even if that doesn't happen, I at least got the acknowledgement that like, I'm like, okay, he's not blowing me off. He still wants to hang out with me. Like, cool. And I'm very much looking forward to carry on conversations we've had privately and talk personally and, and faster than a text or whatever. But it's a thing where for me getting to do that has, it's wild. Cause like it makes me happy to have these conversations and these connections with somebody that in some cases I've long looked up to you. Like you were talking about Corey, you are like, Oh, I don't, I don't know if Corey's ever going to remember me or can pick me out or whatever. But it's like, at the very least, I'm a little bit jealous of that because you guys connected on a deeper level than just being friends. You connected on a, on a musical level of like having to right. do this thing. And like n not many people get to speak that language together. And like, that's a very intimate thing. And so oh, to me, like me, that's I understand doing, doing a song with him was one of the highlights of my career. Absolutely. Just even one of those things, like I'll die knowing I did it, <laughs> but <laughs> no, like you said, though, it's I'm guilty of the uh, the late text, the bad communication skills. But I mean, like I, one thing I always revert back to is people put musicians on pedestals, and none of them are. None of us are. It's <laughs> we're all like you know rats trying to feast, and some of those rats happen to move into a castle. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know. It's and then suddenly they're put on this pedestal until they're not, and then they're knocked down. It's yeah. You see it. Time I think time for me, again. my I think for me, my biggest thing is just more of understanding that, as you were saying earlier, time is finite. And yeah. another bigger thing for me with therapy was setting boundaries and and understanding that I need to set boundaries in order to have more compartmentalization in my life. And so to me. I know a text like I'm getting better at it because I, I understand this now logically, but it's like, you know, like I, I messaged someone the other day and or a while ago and they just got back to me like probably five months later and they're like, dude, I'm so sorry. And I was like, that's fine. That's the point of this medium of texting is like you get back to me when it's convenient for you. I don't take it personally. Like it's fine. Right. And that's the other thing too about people in, you know, this music business side of things. It's like, dude, you're getting pulled in a million different directions at all times where I need to create something. I have a deadline of getting this thing done. I got to depress. I got to tour. I got to whatever. I got to spend time with my wife. I got to do these things. Like there's only 24 hours in a day and we all have to figure out how we're best utilizing that time. I don't take it personally anymore. And I think that's, right. that's the thing as I get older, like that I am more appreciative of that. I have the understanding to step outside of myself and just understand that, that's life and we're all living it. And the beauty of having direct access to so many people, which is not something that I don't think we as people should have because then no, it feels like we have to be on all the time. So like when I text you and you don't text me maybe for a while or, Oh fuck, I just saw this four weeks later. It's like, dude, it's fine. I don't care if it really oh, was that important. I would, I would have called you or something. I would have, I would have made it a pr priority to make it a priority. Right. I'm like, I run my phone on silent and I, I can't take it even, especially with like work, my work. <laughs> oh God. It swallows me alive. But by the way, what do you yeah. do for a job? Cause after seeing you with an employee the other day on my anniversary, I was trying to figure uh, out like Bridget was like, what does he do? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the company that I was hired into in 2008, right. When still remains broke up. Jesus. Um, I've been with them for God going on 16 years and, uh, my wife and I, we were made partner last year. So oh, your wife is involved in the company too. Yep. She is now. Yep. So Ooh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, I have pretty a, massive for us. So I have a different question when you're done with answering this question. No, yeah. It's not as massive for us just because as far as like, it's, Pretty cool to own a business and a business you've worked for for 15, 16 years. And suddenly, like, I don't know, I have all the freedom I want. But at the same time, I have more responsibility than I've ever had in my life because I 
we have 10 employees and it's our job to keep the company running. <laughs> so, My question to you then, because I worked for the company that Bridget works at. I'm had she was like the eighth employee at this company. And now they have, I think, almost 200, I think, at this point. Um, it was a real problem for her and I working at the same company because, like, inevitably, as partners do, you complain about your day, your job, and so forth. And it got to a point where sometimes I would just complain about something I was going through at my job in my department. And then she would be like, oh, why the fuck are they doing that? Like, that's... It's not how they're supposed to be doing this, or you should not like this doesn't matter. Da, 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 da. And then I realized like we couldn't get away from the job because we oh, both work for yeah. the same company. It'll and swallow so it alive. created this. And that was the thing is that I realized it started creating this this problem where we just lived our jobs because we worked yeah. for the same company, we knew all the same people, all the same problems. And eventually, like I just decided to leave because I was like, I value my marriage over this fucking company and this job. Right. And no, it's worked. It's, I it's feel worked like, great for us. But I, awesome I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I was gonna say, how do you our guys set that boundary or the priority of of work and our home first, life without it? Our, our first our first year, we had to be like, all right, we can't talk about work anymore. We'd be on a walk with mm. the dog, or but um, but it's two different departments, and mm. it's easy for us to kind of like cut off our days and have a relationship outside of working at the same company. But I know exactly what you're talking about. At first it was like, it'd be eight o'clock at night and an email would pop up and I would bring this up to her and she'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> or, <laughs> or she, now I want, I don't, don't want to say that's what her response would be. Or she would bring it up to me and I'd be like, I can't take it on right now, but I know exactly what you went through because we kind of went through it for a bit, but, I guess for me, it, it worked out in our favor because, yeah, we're doing all right, man. Yeah. Good to hear. Good to hear yes. it didn't have the same effect as it did for me where I was like, I got to get the fuck out. And even telling people in my exit interview, I was like, I value my marriage more than this fucking company. So I'm sorry. I'm out. No. <laughs> fair fair play. Well, you're no, it yeah. makes sense. I get, I get it. Everyone actually asked us, like, how the hell do you guys work together? I'm like, works for us. But yeah, I mean, I could see it working for some, but like for us, it just, it just didn't, yeah. but it's hard. It's hard to have that. It's hard to have that conversation and to, to be able to step outside of yourself and your, your work relationship and your, your home relationship and understand like something's got to go. Then for me, right. it was like, I'll, I'll bow out. Like I'm, <laughs> I don't have the career in this and I'm not making the the money. So for me, it just made sense to, to bow out and go find something else and not, and bitch about my job where it's like you have no understanding of who this is or who these people are and it has no effect on right. you so right oh i get it i get it for sure um kind of wrapping up where can everyone find you or anything you would like to plug online uh kill the lights has a new record coming out uh in march we have more announcements coming <laughs> with before that um Still Our Mains currently has two sh local shows in Grand Rapids booked. Uh, I just saw someone, some dudes flying in from Mexico, some dudes flying in from Europe. Uh, so even though it's in Grand Rapids, feel free to come. There's a few, I think it's a hundred or something tickets left. At each one I of feel like games. a real dick when I'm like, um, hey, can my wife and I come for free? <laughs> oh, dude, actually, I've, I've had to apologize to so many friends. Like I tell people up front, like, you should come. I said, but... After our wives and kids, we already have like 20 people on the guest list. So yeah, got to bite. I told uh, I told my brother. I think I, I think Hollow Front was like I think Tyler from Hollow Front the other day is like I got you, and I was like, okay, please, <laughs> dude. Dope, I have to sweet. I have to buy I have to buy tickets for like a bunch of shows coming through, and I forgot how broke one goes buying tickets to shows. I was like, fuck, I have like no money. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about I've actually thought about buying 20 tickets just to give out to friends because I'm like I feel like a dick being like come pay to watch me play but it's just hold a, on it's at so that at, at that venue hold on I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end on this because this is gonna this is really funny so at the venue that you guys are playing at at least one of them the 
and I don't know, maybe it's a different deal for you guys, but as and when I book shows there, I know the deal is more based on door tickets sold, get you more of the door after this amount to rent the room, so on and so forth. So I had thought about doing my wedding reception there. And I was like, Hey, how much is it to rent the room? And they come back with a number that's like almost five times the amount of it to rent the room to put on a show. And they were like, I was like, whoa, why is it so much more money? Like, well, it's close to the public unless you want to open your reception up to the public. And then my asshole brain kicked in and I was like, maybe I do want to quote unquote, open it to the public. I'm going to book a show. That's my reception. I'm going to sell it for the lowest that they'll amount, which I think is $6 a head. And I'm going to buy all the tickets myself. <laughs> and then I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm going to get a door deal back for selling out the venue. And then I'm just going to turn around and give the tickets to the people I want to show up. And therefore you'll eventually yeah. end up paying me to rent out that same room that you're trying to sell me or to rent me for thousands of dollars. When Genius. it's, when you would charge me 400 and something or 300, to rent the room straight up for a show. God, should have done it. I should have, but I've always so, thought about like yeah. bands should do the same thing. If they're really like kind of close to maybe selling out, if they don't doing the same thing, like buying the last like handful of tickets, cause they're going to make that money back on the, on the back end. Fair play. Fair play. Again, that's, like that that's idea. getting into the, into the weeds of like the, that <laughs> side of shit. Right. I want my back end deal. Love it. But yeah, Looking forward to seeing you guys. Uh, I'm going to try to make it to the Pyramid Scheme show because I think the show you guys are doing at the DAC is on a Sunday. And I, that's Skeletons. That's Skeletons. Doing laundry. Skeletons, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. Skeletons. Dude, you, and that's uh, my laundry and all that day. <laughs> you'll come, you'll day. come hang. We'll, oh, yeah. we'll get you in either I'll, way. We'll get you in either way. I'll get, sort of I'll get drinks. I'll bring me a bottle of something. Yeah. Just carry a guitar like <laughs> backstage with me and like, oh, he's, he's my guitar tech. Now I'll get okay. you sorted out. And then, you're good. You're good. No worries. Yeah. And then I'll have Bridget come with all the other wives. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Sounds there good, go. dude. All right. Well, well thank cheers. you so much for taking the taking the time. Yeah.